all of the public that have joined us today. Uh, this is the Planning Advisory Committee meeting for January the 10th, 2023. Welcome everybody to the new year. Um, I'll call the meeting to order. We have a, just met our quorum this today. We have regrets from Councillor Killam, Ms. Friars, and Mr. Morris, but we still have Councillor Allen, Councillor Windsor, Councillor Granger, myself, Councillor Armstrong, and our citizen member, Ms. Gagnon, with us today, so we're free to move along. Uh, we have an agenda before us. Are there any amendments to the agenda from any of the members? Nothing? Can I have a motion? Oh, before I do that, are we on the voting system or are we hands only? Okay, so I, I just so I know how to go about this. So can I have a motion to approve the agenda, please? Councillor Allen, thank you. Councillor Granger, thank you. All those in favor, re please register your vote. Yep, there we go. And that's unanimous, thank you very much. And now that we have an approved agenda, this is an opportunity for members of the committee to disclose any conflict of interest items that they may have uh, based on what is on our agenda. I see no hands. And uh, we also have before us the uh, minutes from our December the 13th, 2022 meeting. Hopefully everyone's had a chance to review. If there's no errors or omissions, I'll t entertain a motion to approve. Ms. Gagnon, thank you. Councillor Windsor, thank you. All those in favor, please register your vote. Great. So we'll move on to the, the order of the day. Uh, the first item we have up is an application to rezone properties at 5783 and yeah, and 5811 Highway 1 in Cambridge. And that file belongs to Ms. Ullman. And I will turn on your mic. And it is all yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this is a land use bylaw map amendment, a rezoning application for 5783 and 5811 Highway 1 in Cambridge. So the purpose of this proposal is to rezone from a residential one and two unit R2 zone to the residential multi-unit R4, uh, sorry, R4 zone. The proposal consists of 28 residential rental units. So this is an approximate location of the subject properties. So Kevin Roscoe on behalf of Cornwallis Holdings has submitted a rezoning application for these properties. So Cornwallis Holdings owns one of the properties and the other properties are, is owned by the Lohees and we did receive a letter, letter of authorization for that, from them. Um, this development could be a mixture of ground level housing typologies and the units would primarily be made up of two to three uh, bedroom units with garages. Um, the applicant's childhood home is located and his business is located beside these parcels of land and he hopes that his proposal will help address the lack of available rental properties within the area and provide much needed housing for families and seniors. Uh, the applicant and his father are responsible for Camro Place, which is um, a rental development about a half a mile east of, this, of these subject properties. Um, they began that in 1990 and it's a well sought after uh, rental housing development and it's mostly occupied by seniors. It has grown um, to about 88 rental units since 1990. So this is um, the proposal. Staff recognizes that this rezoning application will provide um, higher density housing in this location but the subject property is located within the Cambridge Growth Center and along a main transportation corridor. <coughs> so within the Cambridge Growth Center, this is an area specifically identified for a diversity of residential uses. So as we can see from the preliminary plan, 
it, it's not um, the entire subject properties. So this section on the side would be um, subdivided off at a later date and remain with this residential dwelling that's on it. So it's only the area outlined in red where he's looking to do this rental development. It's about 6.4 acres out of the 9.4 acres. Um, and he's designed his site plan around um, the setbacks, or sorry, the separation distance from the water course that is on the property. And as you can see, there is an easement on the property um, from Transportation and Works. And last year, Mr. Roscoe did receive approval from the Department of Environment to replace that culvert. So the, um, right now, the subject property slopes um, away from Highway 1 down a little bit. It's relatively flat, and the um, lots are a mix of vegetated and clear lands. So the subject property is surrounded by a mixture of residential and commercial uses. So this includes bike shop, the construction company, a farm, pizzeria, bakery, and an auto body shop. Some of the things we'll look at more in depth is with, that it is within the Cambridge Grove Center. It is on the Highway 1 transportation corridor. Um, the Harvest Moon Trail it abuts the back of the property here, and it is in close proximity to major employers. So this is the zoning map. As you can see, it is zoned R2 currently. And <coughs> sorry, the lands to the east and the south are, are also zoned residential one and two unit. Um, and we have some light industrial zoning, light industrial commercial zoning. The lands to the west of the subject property are zoned general commercial. And then the lands to the, the north that abut the property um, are zoned rural mixed use. So this is the future land use map. So as you can see, it is in the residential designation and R4 is permitted within this designation. So these are some site photos. The first photo is the proposed access point. So it would be just past, this is the driveway for 5811. The proposed access would be just past this in the background. The second photo is looking northward into the site and the left-hand side is the approximate location of the proposed entrance. Here, we, the first photo is looking east on the site, and the water course, which was identified, it's a drainage ditch. I guess it runs from the major highway across the farmland through the subject properties, so that's why there was an existing culvert there. So, um, it's been referred to both as a water course and a ditch, and we're taking kind of the stance that whatever is in the culvert would be the ditch and the other portion of it would be the water course. Photo two is a cleared area of the site and it shows the kind of vegetation that is on it. So for poly policy review, enabling municipal planning strategy policies, um, council shall consider amendments to any of the zoning maps in the land use bylaw provided the application is for a specific development and is A, to rezone land to another zone enabled within the same designation, unless the zone change is specifically prohibited within this strategy. As I pointed out before, it is within the residential designation. So the residential multi-unit R4 zone is enabled in this designation. The other criteria are not applicable to this application. So 5.3.5, council shall consider in relation to all applications to rezone land, the applicable zone placement policies, including any specific policy criteria for applying the proposed zone set out within the strategy, and the impact of both the site, oh sorry, the specific development proposal and of other possible uses permitted in the proposed zone. So the proposed rezoning is consistent with the zone intent and placement. The impact of this proposed development and the other possible uses have been considered and are compatible with the objectives of the growth center. The proposed zone would enable the diversification of the existing housing stock and type within the growing Cambridge growth center. 
The subject property is located near services and commercial uses. This proposal promotes efficiency in infrastructure delivery with access to central sewer along Highway 1. The location of the subject property along the main transportation corridor allows easy access for people um, you know, to get to work or it, it provides easy access to, to the region. And then with the, the Harvest Moon Trail directly behind or adjacent to the property, this promotes active transportation. So statement of regional interest for settlement. To ensure an effective, efficient, and focused pattern of development that will support planned resident, residential growth in response to the needs of the public. So this proposal is keeping in the intent of the regional statement of interest regarding settlement, as the proposal offers a planned residential development with a mixture of rental typologies in response to the growing need of the community. This planned development will increase the number of rental properties while focusing the increase within the growth center. So for the residential multi-unit zone intent, lands in this zone are for compact development in strategic locations, such as along main transportation corridors and near employment and shopping destinations. This zone is intended to include up to 16 residential, residential units in a dwelling in a variety of building types. So the subject properties are in a portion of Cambridge where there is an established housing stock. With frontage along Highway 1, it's a main transportation corridor, and it is close to many uh, major employment centers like Michelin, the Annapolis Valley Regional Industrial Park, King's Regional Rehabilitation Center, and three schools. <coughs> the proposed development is in the area with Central Sewer, and it um, and this type of infrastructure is consistent with the goals and objectives of Section 2.1 of Growth Centers. These locations help to direct development away from agricultural land and contribute to the efficient use of public infrastructure and complete communities with more transportation options. The subject property is located, uh, located again, adjacent to the Harvest Moon Trail. So for water course protection in the municipal planning strategy, 2.4.8, council shall regulate the separation distance between developments and water courses, including increasing separation distance for uses that may create a higher risk of water course contamination to protect water courses from development. So the applicant has designed this site plan around the required 50-foot separation distance from the water course to mitigate any potential issues. For growth centers, the goal is to provide vibrant, complete communities and growth centers with municipal servicing, economic development, and a higher quality of life and distinct character. The settlement and economic development objectives of growth centers are to provide a wide range, sorry, a wide range of urban development business opportunities supported by cost-effective municipal services. And as I've pointed out, um, this, this application does fit that criteria. The transportation objectives of growth centers are to promote development of compact, complete communities, which I've already pointed out, it does meet that criteria as well. As, demonstra as demonstrated, the proposal is in line with the goals and objectives of growth centers. It does promote diversity in housing along a main transportation corridor. It's close to major employers. It has access to municipal servicing, and it also promotes active transportation. Section 5.3.7 of the Municipal Planning Strategy, the general criteria contain a number of general criteria for applications for a MAP amendment to the applicable land use bylaws. These criteria consider the impact of the proposal on road networks, services, development pattern, environment, finances, well fields, as well as the proposal's consistency with the intent of the planning strategy. The proposed rezoning is consistent with the intent of the municipal planning strategy to enable much needed multi-unit residential opportunities within growth centers. And the proposal does meet the general criteria. As a result, a positive recommendation is being made to the Planning Advisory Committee. 
So properties within 500, um, so this is where we are. We're at the Planning Advisory Committee. Notification letters were sent out to 19 property owners within 500 foot radius, and we received no feedback. A public information meeting was held on June 13th, and the video was added to the planning application um, website. Three people were in attendance, but we received no comments from them, and we have received no public comments since. So um, once the next step would be the first reading after the Planning Advisory Committee. So staff are recommending that the Planning Advisory Committee forward a positive recommendation by passing the following motion. Thank you very much. I had a little delay getting my light on there. Um, are there any questions of clarification for staff? Councillor Windsor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Katie. Uh, my question was, was uh, maybe I missed it, um, the R4, uh, the zoning to R4, what is the intent for development there? Is it a continuation of similar units or is there some more significant buildings going in there, more multi-unit buildings? Hmm? Sorry, your light's not on. There you go. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Um, so the intent is to put in uh, duplexes and townhouse type ground level um, residence, two to three bedroom. Is does that clarify? Thank you. It does. Thank you, Councilor Windsor. Councilor Granger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just wondering if there was any feedback from the letters that got sent out. Through you, Madam Chair, um, we didn't receive any um, opposition th um, from fire or environment or engineering. Everyone was, um, there were no concerns for this file. And may I ask another question? Yes, thank you. Um, how many acres is this? I know uh, the rezoning says that it, 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 it's a maximum of five. So how many acres are we actually talking about for this? Through you, Madam Chair. So the total parcel is 9.4 acres and the total development is 6.48. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gagnon? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just had a question regarding what type of commerce or business is next door to the zoning that's C, uh, commerce, and is there any potential conflict with multi-units um, next door rather than just one or two home? Like, could there be any after-the-fact issues? Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll just show you on this map here. So on this side of the property, this is a farm. And then right here, this section of the property is going to not be included in the development. The, the applicant's property is actually here. This is his business property. And his childhood home is here. So his property is the commercial um, property that abuts the the proposed development. And the type of uh, commercial business is not an issue for, or it just couldn't, wouldn't potentially have conflict with the type of development that's proposed? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, um, it's a construction company. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I don't see any other questions, if you don't mind. One from me, um, your slide 13, the residential multi-unit, I just don't understand the wording. It maybe we could, you could clarify a bit. Yeah, um, this zone is intended to include up to 16 residential units in a dwelling in a variety of building types. That says to me that there's going to be a building there that has 16 units in it. So I think there, I think maybe there needs to be a little bit of wordsmithing there. I mean, is anybody else reading that the same way I am? All right. Oh, I got two lights on. Who wants it? 
Trish. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just to clarify, um, what may be confusing is the fact that the, the zone, the R4 zone, okay. allows for development to be as high as a 16-unit apartment building. What's been disclosed to us through the applicant is that is not their intention. Okay. Um, but it certainly could happen. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Ms. Mosher, did you have something to add? No, I think I'm good. <laughs> okay. So if there's no other questions of clarification, the motion on the floor before us, maybe you can put that back up for me, is that the Planning Advisory Committee recommends that Municipal Council give first reading to and hold a public hearing regarding the application to rezone the properties at 5783 and 5811 Highway 1, PID 55379507 and PID 55158273 Cambridge, from the residential 1 and 2 R2 zone to the residential multi-unit R4 zone, as described in Appendix A of the report dated January 10, 2023. Do I have a mover, please? Councillor Allen and Councillor Windsor, thank you. Is there any debate on the motion? No debate, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Oh, sorry, you can register your vote now. And that's unanimous, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Holman. The next item that we have before us is an application to enter into a development agreement at 85 Middle Dyke Road in North Kentville. And that file belongs to Mr. Fredericks. And your mic is on. <clears throat> Thanks very much and good afternoon. Uh, we've got a planning application for a development agreement uh, for a home-based business in North Kentville. The applicant is Calvin Millett, uh, who's applied for this development agreement. The development agreement is needed to permit the existing home-based business that's already on the property at 85 Middle Dyke Road. Mr. Millett owns and operates Acadia Roofing, which is a type of uh, contracting uh, business. And uh, again, the development agreement is required to permit the type and the size of home-based business in this location. So Acadia Roofing is a long-established roofing company here in the valley, and they use portions of the residential property at 85 Middle Dyke Road for both office space and uh, storage of equipment and tools. Uh, roofing companies um, you know, require a lot of equipment, dump trailers and scaffolding and, and ladder lifts uh, and so on. So there's quite a, quite a lot of storage that goes along with that. And they do have a uh, detached garage behind the, behind the dwelling where most of that occurs. So the type of use, uh, roofing, a roofing company is essentially defined in our land use bylaw as a building and construction contractor. That type of use is normally um, a level three home-based business. Uh, home-based home businesses are divided into uh, level one, level two, and level three. Uh, level one is uh, applicable to every residential dwelling essentially in, in, the, in the municipality. Level two is a similar kind of thing. It expands the list a bit, but it applies to properties within growth centers that are on a collector road. Okay, so that's the biggest difference. Level one could be on any interior residential street. Level two can, um, can, can allow more opportunities, uh, but you need to be on a, a collector road. And then level three type home-based businesses are, are in the rural areas, so everywhere outside of our growth centers. This situation is somewhat unique because the property in question is on the very edge of a growth center. It's, um, it's on Middle Dyke Road, and Middle Dyke Road is the boundary. The center line of that road is the boundary between growth center and rural area. So the properties across the street are eligible for a level three home-based business, but the applicant's property, is technically within the growth center, uh, is only eligible for a level two. But the building, or sorry, the property itself is very much... Um, uh, a rural-like property. It's very semi-rural. Semi uh, it's in an area that is quite rural and, uh, again, on the very edge. And it's a large property, and it has the same sort of benefits that we find in a rural area when it comes to separation from neighbors and uh, property size and so on. So the property is 85 Middle Deck Road. Again, there's a, there's a primary dwelling there where the applicant lives. 
and a home-based business that's operated partially out of the building, part of the dwelling, and partially out of a, a detached garage. Now, council supports home-based businesses. This was a, a significant component of our new planning strategy. Um, it's, in, it's, it's intended that uh, these home-based businesses are, are well integrated into neighborhoods because we're not looking at um, you know, disrupting the kind of character of our neighborhoods, uh, but very much um, enable uh, many homeowners to, or, or renters to uh, establish a home-based business. These are, uh, you know, this comes with many benefits, including um, you know, either financial support for your mortgage or your rent, uh, it, it enables, uh, facilitates some self-employment, reduces commuting costs, and uh, provides for efficient use of some of the existing buildings that we have within our growth centers. So there's a lot of policy uh, direction here with home-based businesses. Primarily these are uh, limited, though, to uh, that the owner of the dwelling must uh, be the owner of the, of the business. So there are some limits on number of employees, and there are some limits on size, again, depending on location. When you're on a collector road, you can have more square footage and, and more slightly more intense uses. The appearance is intended to be fairly well integrated within existing neighborhood conditions, neighborhood character. Uh, and we, it, it's, it's intended that these would be permitted anywhere a residential dwelling is permitted. So if we allow for a residential home, we're allowing for some form of home-based business. And so those are council's home-based business policies that support that um, and you can imagine a roofing business for example uh, doesn't need to be on kind of main street uh, it doesn't need to be on commercial street in your mind it doesn't need to be on uh, main street canning or, or wherever so some of these things can be uh, complementary uh, can can contribute to the economic kind of success of a, of a region but they don't they're and they're, they're semi-commercial uses but they don't need to be in the kind of commercial core they don't need to be right on main street so that's where home-based businesses um, are quite uh, successful and, and, and quite popular in uh, the county. So we're within North Kentville, and again, we're right on the edge of this, and uh, some of these maps will demonstrate that. This is the subject property. Again, it's, it's quite large. It's about nine, over nine acres, nine and a half acres, and uh, it's, it's accessed from Middle Dyke Road, and, and I would remind uh, PAC members that this forms the boundary of the growth center. So all the land on the east side of Middle Dyke Road is in the rural area, and everything on the west is in the urban area or within the growth center. Uh, this is the primary dwelling here, and you can see this is a detached garage where uh, most of the um, most of the home-based business is kind of conducted from. And, and with a roofing company, you can imagine most of this is like storage and office space, uh, storage of different equipment that they use on different types of jobs, rather than um, you know production. They're not producing roofing stuff in this location. They're just kind of storing equipment. And so in that sense. Uh, it's a relatively uh, low impact use. Some building and construction contractor uses could be more intense than, than a roofing contractor, for example. Uh, it's also worth noting that this is a really, really densely forested property, it's, um, and it's very well separated as a result. Uh, so to the west is the sort of residential neighborhood of North Kentville, um, and to the south is the sort of uh, multi-unit development that's on the corner of North Kentville on Middle Deck Road. So certainly a populated area to the kind of south and west, um, but the property itself really faces Middle Dyke Road and is uh, certainly feels like it's a, a disconnected from, from this neighborhood over here. So again, the property is sort of semi-rural. Um, you can see this is one of, it's got two driveways um, on Middle Dyke Road. You can see this is the kind of rural setting. This is Middle Dyke Road right here. Uh, and you know, there's an agricultural kind of field across the street. Um, so certainly the feel here is very much more uh, rural and agricultural than, uh, than more urban. And it's a very wooded property, very well separated from neighbors on all sides, not, not just the rear. And uh, it's, it's again over nine acres in size. So it's accessed from Middle Deck Road. There are two driveways on Middle Deck Road and that is again the boundary of the growth center. Uh, Middle Deck Road is designated as a collector road on our land use bylaw map. And so this property would be eligible for a level two home-based business. These are some photographs of uh, those driveways. And it also gives an example, um, the, you know, this one here, uh, the south driveway 
uh, provides primarily access to the to the dwelling, and uh, then they have an alternative driveway where you know pickup trucks and trailers with uh, shingles in them and so on can can come in, and, and those two driveways are kind of separate. But you can see these, you know, taken from the street, you know, you can you can barely see the home, let alone uh, any kind of impact from a home-based business. So it's a very well uh, suited property and very well buffered and separated. The zoning is pretty uh, mixed in this area. Um, you know, the Kent Fields Estate kind of development is in this R4 zone here. Uh, there is some R3 zoning in the middle here, and the subject property covers some R2, some R3, and some R4 zone. So quite a, quite a mixture uh, of zoning. Uh, but you can see directly across the street is the A1 zone, so this is agricultural zoning over here. And so uh, staff are feeling like it, while it is within a residential zone, it, the, the property is very much uh, oriented towards Middle Dyke Road, oriented towards that kind of rural area, and uh, has all those characteristics of a rural property, and, and therefore could, could be considered as a kind of uh, a rural home-based business. And so there's a policy within the planning strategy that allows us to consider by development agreement home-based business situations in, in any kind of possibility. So we can consider our development agreement for um, a, a new type of home-based business or an expanded home-based business, uh, expansions to an established home-based business, and including uh, uses that may not be considered a home-based business. So um, you know, we can consider different home-based business options through this policy. And the criteria that we look at um, primarily is that the use it will not unduly impact the neighborhood uh, cause, you know, through, through either noise, fumes, traffic volume, parking, or other potential hazards. And in this case, um, you know, there may certainly be some noise associated with pulling ladders off of trucks and uh, disconnecting trailers and all of that sort of work that's associated with a roofing company. Um, but because it's so well buffered and it's such a large property, um, that impact has, has not been a problem for the, for the surrounding neighborhood. We, we haven't heard any concerns uh, from anyone. Uh, regarding noise or, or uh, traffic volumes. So staff are confident that the, the, the characteristics of the property can satisfy this requirement. It's quite large and it's wooded. And we've written development agreement that kind of ensures some of that, uh, some of that can maintain, be maintained. The next criteria is that uh, we continue with a limited scope and scale and design. And you know, the design and scale of this operation is, is th those are largely controlled through the development agreement. We've got fairly significant setbacks that require there be a, quite a large wooded kind of buffer surrounding uh, the use. Uh, we also make sure that the development can, can meet the sort of general criteria. Those look at, you know, the intent of the planning strategy and certainly there is uh, policy support to um, uh, to, to enable home-based businesses and enable uh, a variety of home-based businesses through a development agreement. Uh, the intent of the planning strategy is to keep some of this type of use in the rural areas because sometimes it can be uh, um, obnoxious through noise or traffic. Uh, but in this case, we're dealing with a fairly unique property and I would say it's, it's certainly consistent with the intent of the development agreement option that's given uh, within the planning strategy. There's no financial impact on the municipality. There's no kind of uh, well field concerns in this area. Uh, very low potential for land use conflict uh, and very, very much a suitable site. So these criteria are reviewed in more detail in the report, but staff are feeling like um, it's an appropriate uh, location and an appropriate situation. We've got a very well buffered property uh, and, a, and a relatively uh, benign home based business. This is a site plan that's currently being updated. We expect to have a, a revised version of this uh, later this week to replace this one, um, mostly for clarification and, and uh, legibility. We're gonna increase some of the font sizes and so on. Um, so again, this is the dwelling and this is the garage. These are the two driveways that they use. And again, this sort of utility driveway provides access to the kind of gravel parking area where trailers are parked and uh, equipment is stored down here. And, um, and then this upper driveway is primarily for the dwelling itself. So the, we've drafted a development agreement that permits Acadia Roofing to kind of operate from this location. Um, again, that's a building and construction contractor type land use, so that's what's referenced in the development agreement. There's a 70 foot setback on the rear and side yards, and that's again to protect um, or provide that kind of separation between the existing residential neighborhoods to the west and the south. Uh, from what could be a kind of ladder operation. 
there's limited signage, again, consistent with the home-based business requirements uh, or regulations. Uh, limited subdivision ability. There's some capability of subdividing the property, but it still needs to meet that kind of 70-foot setback. And some controls over lighting, uh, servicing, and, and maintaining uh, a tidy appearance as well. So this is the, the, the process. Um, a public information meeting was, was held. Uh, it was recorded online at the time. Uh, it was shared with 55 of the surrounding properties, and uh, staff received no feedback from, from any of those neighbors. So that, you know, we, that may or may not suggest, but per perhaps indicates, you know, how little impact may be caused by this existing home-based business, and um, it, with the ability of, of regulating it through a development agreement, uh, staff are confident that, uh, you know, land use compatibility will be maintained. And again, it's a nine acre property, heavily wooded on the very edge of a growth center, so staff are feeling like it's pretty appropriate uh, for the area. And uh, following planning advisory committee, it would go, it would go forward to, to council for their first reading or initial consideration. So staff, again, we believe that there's a development agreement here that's pretty reasonable um, based on this kind of unique characteristics of this property and this sort of semi-rural property on the very edge of a growth center. And uh, the setback requirements within the development agreement uh, maintain that sort of land use compatibility with uh, any surrounding uh, neighbors. And with that, I would pass it back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fredericks. Are there any questions of clarification for staff? Uh, Councillor Windsor. Thank you. So um, this business has been obviously there for uh, quite a while. How, how long has it been established there? Through you, Madam Chair, I don't know the exact number of years, but I think um, they've many. been many. Yeah. And my question, which I was trying, maybe would help me understand. Do we have a definition of what a home-based business is? Yeah. And I asked that in the context of, you know, like uh, my my perception was a home-based business where the actual work, the services rendered, or whatever happened on the property mm. and this here obviously is is a business that's going to deliver their services their product right across the broad geographical area do we have a definition of what constitutes a home-based business I think Miss Mosher would like to weigh in here I just heard her open her binder yeah you <laughs> bet yeah. thank you <laughs> good help sign uh, through you, Madam Chair, to Council Windsor, a home-based business is defined as an accessory use of a residential unit for employment involving the manufacture and or sale of goods and or services to the public and where the residential unit is the principal residence of the business operator. So this fits the definition. Correct. Thank you. And that was my questions. Thank you, Council Windsor. Uh, Ms. Canyon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I have uh, three questions, I think. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is uh, just regarding the map uh, Mark just showed uh, the property. It said something about a foundation under construction behind the house, which is different from the garage that is currently built for uh, the business. Um, just clarification on that. Is it attached to the dwelling? Is it an increase to the dwelling for business purposes? Is it a future garage for the business? or? Thanks for your question through you, Madam Chair. That's part of why the site plan is getting updated as well. Uh, that building was under construction when, the, when that version of the site plan was, was produced, but it, that building is now there. My understanding is it's a, is it an, a residential accessory structure, so it's another garage, primarily for the dwelling, a storage of, of their own personal uh, stuff, less so to deal with uh, the home-based business. Okay. Um, and in the development agreement, uh, section two, part two, development requirements, um, it states uh, 2.1b, it talks about the expansion, uh, potential expansion, so no expansion of the garage building um, without an amendment to this agreement, uh, but an expansion of up to 25% for uh, the dwelling where the people reside, um, without amendment to this agreement. Uh, so if there is an amendment to, if they wanna grow the business, build another garage or that kind of modification or expand the garage, um, would this end up again uh, at the pack? Like, would would we have uh, at the pack the opportunity to see that expansion, or would the agreement just permit it to go through the process without going through us? 
Yeah, through you, Madam Chair, it, it depends on what type of growth it is, is happening there. Like there is some allowance for, for growth to occur there. There's also some allowance for accessory buildings to, to be built. Th those things would not come back through this committee. If there was a significant addition proposed to the garage, like they were gonna add another bay or multiple bays to that garage, uh, that would represent a change to this, the agreement that would, would be reconsidered. Uh, but we wanted to allow for some level of, of, of uh, growth to occur, and so we wanted there to be the ability for you know, a shed or a, a small storage building uh, to be added without going through the entire process again. Right, and this development agreement always applied to, if the business gets sold or the house gets sold, this development agreement applies to future property owners? That's correct. Okay, and the last question was regarding the setback buffering at 2.7, so the 70 feet. I noticed on the map that the neighboring property that's all forested as well is um, R4 in residential uh, development, which we just went through, which is multi-units. Um, and so I'm just wondering if in future that land does get developed and mm -hmm. it's a big development, multiple units, and that kind of stuff, would the setback on the other side be as great as the 70 feet in order to maintain that sort of ruralness of the the property um, because it is nine acres is still big but it looks bigger and more rural because the neighboring property is yeah. also very forested but if that were to develop would that rural factor still play in i guess mm, yeah that's a fair question and i, I the, the setback applies specific to sp specifically to this subject property, so the the 70 foot setback requirement needs to be within that property. The adjacent properties could be developed, and and they could clear all the vegetation up to the property line if they chose. So in that way, it it may it may um, you know change the feel of of some of the surrounding properties, uh, but the subject property itself would still have a, a significant kind of buffer around the back of it where it meets the adjacent parcels. Okay, and would it still be considered, in your opinion, still pretty rural if that buffer, if the neighboring property did cut all the way to the line and it kept that 70 foot, or should the maybe feet be bigger? Mm. Yeah, no, I, I think 70 feet is appropriate. I mean, there's no magic number in, in this sort of thing. I think 70 is a pretty significant setback uh, when we talk about kind of residential uh, zoning, some some of these setbacks can be as low as four to four to ten feet, right? So so seventy is pretty significant, um, and I think the nature of the pro the subject property feeling more rural is it has a lot to do with its access from um, Middle Dyke Road, and the feel of that road, and the, that the back of this property is very well buffered from the kind of uh, more urban development to the west and south. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, through you, Madam Chair, to Ms. Gagnon. Um, what Mark said is absolutely correct. I just wanted to add a bit to uh, what he did indicate. So the R4, the, it's important to remember that while this property functions as a semi-rural property, it is still very much within the growth center, and we want to see growth in our growth centers. We don't necessarily want to maintain that rural feel that is currently there, and it, certainly in the absence of the business, uh, we would we would want to see development that is consistent with the zoning occur. This business has been there for decades. Uh, just a, a quick Google indicates that the business itself has been operating since 1972. Not sure if it's always been at that location, but um, the 70 foot is is an acknowledgement that this is a use that we wouldn't. I mean, there's a reason why a level three home-based business is not permitted within growth centers. It's this property's uh, characteristics of being located right on the edge and, and having been operated for so many years without any, any land use compatibility issues that we are considering this. But we wouldn't be, we would still, it's still a growth center and we still wanna see that type of growth as evidenced by the zoning in the R3 and R4 zones. We do, we do wanna see higher density residential uses there in the fullness of time, but in the meantime, this business is operating, it's not causing any issues, so we wanted to ensure that it, it can continue to operate legally. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, the only thing that I, I thought I would also mention, that what is also contributing to its feel of being very rural here is there's only a forced main sewer line in front, so Middle Dyke Road doesn't have sewer servicing, so these properties are all on on-site septic. Um, so that in itself is both a limitation for further de 
development until we can get some sewer in there. Um, and the on-site septic is also going to require larger land tracks to be maintained. Councillor Allen. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. My original question was if we approve this development agreement, does it stay with that property only or the new owner can and also have it? So if it stays with the property, do we have the mechanism to state that it's only good for the ownership of the person that applies at the time? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, to Councillor Allen. We don't. We don't have the ability to link it to a person. That's that's just we we deal with uses, not not people. So that's another reason for the uh, larger setback was in anticipation of potentially this property being sold and being used by someone else. Uh, it is important to note that the business would still be required to be a building and construction contractor's use. It couldn't change to a retail store or some other home-based business. It would have to be for the building and construction contractor's use, regardless of who operates it. But all of the other stipulations within the agreement would also need to be met, including the 70-foot setback and the retention of all that vegetation. So in the future, the new owner, if there were one, would have to do what's presently being done there now, like contractor's warehouse, basically. Oh, sorry. Uh, through you again, Madam Chair, to Councillor Allen. Yes, that's correct. It would be limited to that use. Well, I didn't know that till yeah. now. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Windsor? Question of, just a question of clarification on that to Laura. But they wouldn't be compelled to carry on an old business if they wanted to buy the property just and live there. They would, I take it they would not be compelled to. They would just be limited to that as, as opposed to morphing into another business venture. Through you, Madam Chair, to Councillor Windsor, yes, it would still need to be classified as a building and construction contractor's use. Within that term, there is a little bit of leniency. So right now, it's a roofing company. It could just be a general contractor's, or it could be a plumber's, or like, you know, along, maybe not a plumber. That might be a different use. Um, but so a similar building and construction contractor's <coughs> use, yes, it would be limited to that. But there would not be any... We, we don't have any, any way to compel someone to operate a business they don't want to. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't have any other lights. I do have a question. Um, in the past, when we have looked at development agreements, um, especially when there's been a large parcel of land, and I think that, Mark, you said that this was nine acres or something like that, we dealt with um, building envelopes where a certain portion, the development agreement only... Uh, applied to a certain portion of the land. Um, so I'm not sure why we didn't do that in this case. Um, I know that there's restrictions on, on how much, I think Mark said they could only expand like 25% within this development agreement and then it would have to be opened up for, for more. So I'm not understanding if that's the case, why we need to put in a 70 foot buffer. If, if we're constraining them on the amount that they can grow or expand, why do we need a 70-foot buffer? And why was a, a building envelope not used in this particular application? Somebody. I, I, yeah, I'm okay. Go ahead. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, to yourself. Um, so we didn't do the envelopes because the development exists. The buildings are there. So we know where the buildings are. We typically use envelopes on vacant parcels of land to give the developer or the applicant um, a little bit of flexibility. Uh, we don't necessarily want to process an application and then they, they begin construction and they go, oh no, I have a building footprint here and I can't reasonably stay within that building footprint. So we give them an envelope. I mean, sometimes if you're outside the footprint, you know, it could be an inch or two inches, right? There's no, we don't see any value in going through the whole process again for something that reasonably is, is not going to be an issue. So that we do envelopes for new construction, but where this uh, is existing, the buildings are built, 
the applicant has indicated that he's not looking for any expansion, but we do have to turn our minds to potential future owners, and we didn't want the, the reason for the 70-foot setback, and there's language in there around vegetation, is we don't want the vegetation removed because that vegetation is what is protecting those residential uses from this use that is not generating any issues at this time, but a potential future owner may have other ideas. So we put in some controls to account for potential other operations that may not be as respectful of neighbors. And I don't want to be argumentative, but it says that you're only allowed to expand 25%. So if you're only allowed to expand 25%, I don't understand why you need the buffer, because that wouldn't put you where you would need to cut back to a 70% or a 70 foot buffer. Right, and, and that's fair, but the nature of the business is for roofing and roofing materials, which can come with outdoor storage. Mm. So we didn't want a potential future owner removing all the vegetation and having excessive outdoor storage associated with the business. Okay. I'm not sure that I'm satisfied, <laughs> but okay. Uh, Ms. Kenya. Madam Chair, if I may, um, the way I understand Section 2.1 of the Development Agreement, it's the dwelling that um, says expansion of the dwelling for the home-based business use is permitted provided the total area does not exceed 25% of the existing gross floor area of the dwelling. So in my mind, a dwelling, somebody has to dwell in it, so it's separate from the garage. So the way I read the agreement, it's the dwelling, the build where the people dwell that can expand 25%, not the garage, not like, that's the way I understand this agreement. I'm not sure if I understand it correctly, but that's how I read the word dwelling as the place where the person resides, the home business, can expand 25%. Okay. All right. Um, are there any further questions or clarification? So the motion before us is that the Planning Advisory Committee recommends the Council give initial consideration to and hold a public hearing regarding entering into a development agreement to permit the home-based business at 85 Middle Dyke Road, North Kenfold, PID 5539-694, as described in Appendix D of the report dated January 10, 2023. Do I have a mover? Councillor Allen, Ms. Gagnon, thank you. Um, is there any debate? Okay, uh, I'll call the question. All those, please register your vote. That was passed, thank you. Okay, so that takes care of that. Is there any other business? To brief, oh wait a minute, no, we do have one more piece. Um, we need to name um, PAC representative to Lake Monitoring Steering Committee and um, Mr. Fredericks is going to give us a little um, uh, information about that uh, committee. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, just a brief overview of what the uh, Lake Monitoring uh, program is all about and what the Lake Monitoring Technical Advisory Committee uh, does uh, year to year over year um, and and our goal for today is essentially to to uh, to appoint uh, a member of PAC to to join the technical advisory committee the terms of reference for that committee uh, indicates that a PAC member either a counselor or um, or citizen representative uh, should be joining the technical advisory committee and currently uh, we have a vacancy of, in, in that spot so we're looking for member from PAC to join our technical advisory committee. Last uh, month, this was on the agenda uh, as well, but we had a few vacant seats, and I understand that's the case again today, so uh, ho hopefully we can at least have a conversation, but open to, uh, open to maybe finalizing this uh, at, a, at a later date. The lake monitoring program has been going on for a long time. Uh, the purpose largely is to monitor lake water quality through ongoing community stewardship and engagement. Uh, it helps us make informed decisions on land use controls for lakeshore development. 
Um, it helps uh, address some of the local folks' issues or local concerns around lakes, be those citizen concerns uh, regarding lakeshore development. And the process is largely uh, that water uh, samples get collected. Well, I would just uh, acknowledge, uh, Lorian, our, our screen isn't, uh, isn't showing there. Um, the process, so water samples get collected, uh, the data gets compiled, and um, a lake monitoring report uh, comes out for each season. So the lake monitoring program, again, it began in the mid-1990s. It helps inform planning policy, specifically development regulations regarding uh, setbacks, uh, lot widths, um, uh, what, some things that have changed over the years that uh, include uh, limiting the building footprint uh, to, to ensure that there's more uh, natural vegetation rather than a hard surface uh, on each, each lot, lakefront lot, that is. Uh, minimizing land alterations and uh, increasing sort of shoreland setbacks, so pushing pushing homes and cottages back further from the lake. The pro the program itself is volunteer driven. It includes 13 lakes. 12 of those are sampled by uh, individuals who either own a home or cottage uh, on on those lakes, and the, the 13th lake is sampled by uh, staff here, and uh, that's more of our control lake. Uh, that one is Hardwood Lake. Hardwood Lake represents a great uh, opportunity as a kind of control lake because it's, it's the very kind of top of the South Mountain. That is to say, n other lakes don't seem to drain into it. It's kind of uh, the headland water. Um, and it's also very, very limited in development. There's a Girl Guides camp there, and there's some forestry activity nearby, but otherwise there's no, um, there's no residential development on that lake. So um, 13 lakes ranging in, in Lake types. Uh, some of them are part of the Nova Scotia Power Hydro System. Some of them drain into each other. Uh, some of them are spring-fed, and so there's a lot of different kind of characteristics around those lakes. Um, but I just want to highlight that most of the sampling is done by uh, dedicated, very dedicated volunteers. The program helps facilitate awareness, both in the community and here in the municipality. Um, you know, neighbors certainly are aware of the ongoing efforts of their of the volunteers on the lakes, uh, and and sometimes there's a co cooperation between uh, neighbors, who who are if there's if there's a vacancy or something, someone's not able to uh, to sample that month. Uh, there's usually someone on the lake who uh, who's able to fill in, and so there's certainly uh, that grows the awareness of the kind of importance of lake water quality and. Um, and that's largely what the program uh, is doing. It's tracking long-term trends in lake water quality and, uh, again, facilitating awareness and stewardship uh, in the community as well. The program runs from May until October, so the 2022 season just ended uh, a couple of months ago. And uh, each, so each month, uh, a volunteer collects a couple of samples, uh, both from the surface of the lake and close to the bottom of the lake. Uh, those, those composite uh, samples are then analyzed at a water testing lab. The tests that we do are for phosphorus and chlorophyll. Those two are kind of nutrients that can help us predict uh, algae growth. So those are two of the big ones. Uh, we also test and analyze uh, dissolved organic carbon, uh, pH, uh, water temperature, conductivity, uh, color as well. And the sucky depth is, uh, is a disk that sort of helps uh, measure the transparency of the water. So a variety of, uh, of, of observations, but also uh, lab tests are done on these water tests, water samples uh, each and every month. And then the Technical Advisory Committee is a, is a, is a subcommittee of Planning Advisory Committee. Uh, so they report here to this group. Uh, it's comprised of a mix of stakeholders and various experts that includes staff from Nova Scotia Power, uh, freshwater ecologists, uh, and environmental consultants, pr private and public, uh, staff from Nova Scotia Environment, uh, Nova Scotia Dat Natural Resources. Uh, we've also uh, at times had members from uh, Cadia University and Dalhousie University's uh, kind of biology programs. And the, the membership is very much an ad hoc uh, nature. People come and go because of the nature of this uh, group. It's, uh, it's not a permanent kind of appointing, appointed uh, position. It's more of an ad hoc basis. But typically, we have representatives from those sorts of uh, groups, Nova Scotia Power, uh, a few provincial departments, um, and some, some private um, uh, freshwater ecologists. Typically, this committee meets uh, twice a year, uh, usually in the fall and in the spring. Sometimes we meet uh, more than that, kind of on an as-needed basis. 
and the duties of this uh, technical advisory committee are to make recommendations to the planning advisory committee, be it on uh, new lakes to be added, sometimes that has occurred over the years, um, periodic reviews of procedures and uh, public requests, um, but primarily the main uh, focus of this committee is to review uh, the, the analysis uh, work, review the data that's been collected, and approve the, the uh, summary reports for each sampling season. So each sampling season between May and October, uh, we collect a bunch of data, that data then gets analyzed, and a report gets published, um, and those reports are, are largely what the Technical Advisory Committee is, um, is working with. So with that, I pass it back to the chair, and again, uh, I'm, my understanding is that uh, we can appoint someone less so less formally than uh, I think uh, other, other committees, We're looking for, for a member to, of the PAC to join the Lake Monitoring Technical Advisory Committee. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Fredericks. Um, as Mr. Fredericks alluded to, this was on our agenda uh, last month be and was set aside because we had hoped to have more people present today, but we have the same number of people present on different faces. Um, but uh, Ms. Friars was here at our last meeting when we set this aside, and she um, made Ms. Dvorak uh, aware that she is interested in sitting on this committee. So in her absence, I wanted to put that forward to the members that are here. Um, I cannot nominate um, as the chair, but I just wanted to put it out there for uh, the other members that she is interested in uh, sitting in on this particular committee. So um, is there any debate, questions, uh, concerns, anything at all? Ms. Gagnon? Just had a question, uh, Madam Chair, just mm -hmm. regarding um, are these meetings in Halifax? Are they here? Are they virtual? Or uh, how does that work for the meetings? Thanks for your question. Through you, Madam Chair, the meetings are typically held in this building, uh, and, it, and the most recent sessions we've had have been uh, kind of a hybrid. Some people have, have tuned in online uh, and some people in person. Okay, thank you. And um, I didn't, uh, in the monitoring, are there any beaches monitored like in the lakes, the elements for beach, for people to know whether the beach in a lake like Lake Oxford or something like that is, is, is that part of the monitoring that happens or that's a separate monitoring that occurs as well or doesn't occur at all? I have no that, idea. It does, it does occur at the Ellsford Lake, through you Madam Chair, Ellsford Lake it, beach is tested. Uh, it's tested for so, a different set of parameters. Uh, so it's a separate, separate from the program, although Aylesford Lake is one of the lakes that are, is also tested through this program. But generally, though, the, the beaches um, are tested sort of separately outside of this program, uh, one being Aylesford Lake Beach. Um, uh, the provincial beach on Lake George is also tested, I believe, somewhat regularly, uh, but not tested with the same parameters as the Lake Monitoring Program. So uh, they are sort of treated separately. Okay, so the testing in this program is much more related to health of lake versus development uh, kind of influence. That's the intent, yes. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just wanted to uh, jump in to add to what Mark said. So, so it's really important to remember the purpose of this lake monitoring program. It is to, it's to monitor lake water quality as it pertains to, when the program was first started, there was this hypothesis that more development around the lakes will lead to poor lake water quality. And that hypothesis has, under, has underpinned the whole program, and, st and it still does, um, and it has informed things like the 65-foot setback that we've seen in applications around the lakes um, since the lake monitoring program started, but its role is not to be reactive so it's not to understand if a, if a beach is safe for swimming because we're getting those results months after the testing has occurred uh, it's 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 not we don't take the test and then the next day we have the results and we're like oh shut the shut the beach down it's not safe that's that's not the purpose of this uh, program the purpose is really to understand which zones we should apply where? What level of development do we want to permit around the lakes to ensure that there's a balance between people living on the lakes, people having cottages on the lakes, people recreating around the lakes, and um, and, and this testing? So, or, sorry, and, and lake water health. So we're just trying to find that 
balance between enabling people to enjoy the lakes, but not <laughs> but enabling them to enjoy them well into the future. So it's not a reactive, um, you know, we don't, it, it really is just to inform policy. So it's not, it, it, it does have a very different goal than a lot of people seem to think. So that's just important to remember. Okay, so if I may, Madam Chair. Um, um, so if the results, for example, of, of one of those studies would indicate that there's an increase in cyanobacteria and stuff like that in the water, that may be linked to buffer zones around the lake for development. Would then having the PAC committee member there bring that information back to the PAC that can then bring the information to the council as to potentially increasing in our bylaw or in our setbacks buffer zones around that specific lake, for example? Would that be a way that information would inform the policies uh, at the municipal level through the PAC? Uh, three, Madam Chair, two, Ms. Gagnon. We, it wouldn't be around a specific lake. We have two lakefront zones, the S1 zone and the S2 zone. The S1 zone is for lakefront um, residential, so a smaller lot with a smaller frontage. And then the other is lakeshore uh, limited development, I think the zone is called. So as the name states, limited development. So much larger properties, much larger uh, frontages required. So we can't apply an, an increased buffer around a specific lake. It's meant to inform those two zones, how they're written, what's permitted, what is the setback. So it could inform that, though. It, it, it could, it could over time, but, but just to keep in mind, uh, <laughs> if you go back through the reports, you'll see from time to time a lake will spike. You know, one year will have a bad year. So mm -hmm. for example, uh, if I recall correctly, I think it was five years ago, there was uh, Nova Scotia Power did a lot of work on the dam at Lumsden's Dam, and as a result, the water wasn't flowing through the lake system, which meant a buildup of nutrients, which meant poor water quality. Mm -hmm. So, but that's not that one year is not telling the whole story. So, it's not it's it's meant to be a long term analysis. So, if if any given lake had one bad year, it likely wouldn't prompt us to take a look at our regulations. But if consistently a lake is bad or, you know, if we see broader trends, then that might, might prompt us to, to take a look. And that certainly is something that the members, uh, any of the members of the TAC, but as well the PAC member and the council member could raise that, yes. Okay, thank you. Councillor Granger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just wondering, um, so I think I've been on this committee for two years. Have we heard a report back or, I, I, I can't remember, I'm getting old, my mind just kind of goes here and there, but have we had somebody doing this for us mm -hmm. and we've gotten reports? It's been a while. Yes, we've had, we've, we've been running the program. We have a consultant that is um, a little bit slow <laughs> in terms of getting the reports back. Um, he, he did have a, a family emergency during the pandemic, which made travel very difficult. And then once he did travel, he couldn't get back. And so there, there were some things that, that did happen to delay certain reports, but we are, we, we have heard from him. He has said that he is working on them and we should get them back soon. So we are, we're hoping to have it on the agenda um, in, the, in the coming months. And he is very good at attending. Uh, he has attended virtually, I think. I th think, when was that, two years ago? Um, I think it was the last council. No, but he, I think he was at P, he attended PAC a couple of years ago virtually as well. Yeah, a couple of years ago would have been the old council. <laughs> well, maybe you're right. <laughs> Anyways, um, <laughs> we do expect to see reports soon. Great, thank um, you. Thank you. Councillor Windsor, you, oh, you had your hand up. Thank you, madam. I was going to make the motion for Ms. Friars to be appointed, if that was in order. Okay, sure. Yep. So that would, I would so move. Okay. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Allen? 
Are there any other nominations? Madam Chair, it's just because I've noticed Mark's light's still on, so I don't know if Mark had anything to say before. We I just haven't turned it off. Oh, okay, that's all there. Okay, then. No, no, I'm okay. Uh, and we're allowed to uh, nominate and vote Ms. Fryer, even if she's not present here today. Is, yes, because she, she did uh, let us know that she was interested in this. And, and it would have moved forward if we had had more people here okay. last time. So, uh, Thank you. So we have a motion on the floor to appoint uh, Ms. Kate Fryers, a citizen member of the Planning Advisory Committee to the Lake Monitoring Technical Advisory Committee. Um, if there's no debate, I will ask you to register your vote, please. And that is, somebody didn't vote. Jim, you didn't vote, but you're you're affirmative, yes? Okay. We are unanimous. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that, and we'll let uh, Ms. Fryers know that uh, she has another job to do. Um, is there any other business to come before the committee today? No. Nope. I still haven't turned off Mr. Frederick's light. Okay. Um, we have no public here with us today. Uh, the next meeting of the Planning Advisory Committee will be February 14th, 2023, 1 o'clock in these chambers. And if there's nothing else to be brought forward, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Ms. Gagnon, thank you. Ms. <laughs> Councillor Granger, thank you. All those in favor, please register your vote. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much for coming.